Great. So everybody who's in here, this presentation is titled, How Blood Types, Alien Abductions, and the End Times Are Related. It's a presentation by me, Damien Dumar. And I am the publisher, not the author, the publisher of The Last Harvest by Lucian Mars. He is the author. I want to state that clearly because for some reason, everyone thinks I'm the author. Perhaps it's because I do all the marketing for this book. I do all the podcasts. I edited this book. I laid it out. Um, in a past life, I was a publisher. So this book is called The Last Harvest, A Secret History of Lucifera, Aliens, the Illuminati, and the Fate of Humanity. So I threw in some buzzwords there that people like. Lucifera, it's not Lucifer. I want to throw that up right now because a lot of people see that. The first thing their brain says is Lucifer. No, it's not about Lucifer at all. And um, I published this book in January. It's doing pretty well on Amazon. It sells quite well. I've been on many podcasts. We have it in Kindle, paperback, and an amazing audio format. I picked the narrator myself. He is incredible. And for anyone who wants a free copy of the ebook as well as the audiobook, you can come by my booth and I have it all in a USB drive for you. So you get it free. Um, if you want the actual physical copy of the book, you're going to have to buy that because I'm not lugging all these books down here. <clears throat> so, what was that? Ah, yes, my pleasure. So, um, this book is very unique because everything in this book is information that you have never heard anywhere before. There is a lot of information out there on topics such as reptilians. Most of it is recycled and garbage. Uh, the work of David Icke, I have to give him some credit for bringing the notion of shape-shifting reptilians into the forefront of consciousness. When I turn on The Simpsons or Family Guy or American Dad and they have some shape-shifting reptilian, you have to smile and thank David Icke for that. However, David Icke got a lot of things wrong. Uh, for one thing, he makes it sound like every reptilian is somehow the enemy of mankind, and that's not the case. As a matter of fact, the majority of the problems that occur on this planet are not a result of reptilians at all, but rather the greys that a lot of people at this event seem to like to worship. So as a matter of fact, someone blew up an inflatable grey doll and put it in my booth. I, I wasn't sure what to do with that. but. Um, so again, this book has been published because the time for secret societies is over. Time is really short and people need to know the truth about what's going on, the truth about what's happening today, and the truth about their origins. Where did they come from? What are all these extraterrestrial groups? What do they want? How do they interrelate with each other? There's a lot of information out there. A lot of it is also disinformation. And we need to know this stuff now because time is short. Why is that? Well, the Nebu Greys are ready to take this planet for themselves. And they intend to do that by wiping out 90% of the population of the planet. This is why the Georgia Guidestones are on the cover of the book, because the Georgia Guidestones are very clear that 90% of you need to be gone. That's one of the reasons someone blew up the Georgia Guidestones recently, because they weren't happy with this message. Now, once they reduce the population by 90%, they intend to genetically hybridize the survivors to, to suit their purposes, and we'll get into what that is later. And it's my stance that all human beings, and I put them in quotes for a reason, on this planet need to know the truth of their origins as well as the intergalactic conflicts that they are actually a product of. You need to know this because you're going to have to make a free will decision going forward because we don't live in a clockwork, we live in a creation. And the Divine Father, whether you acknowledge his existence or not, he gave you free will. And every decision you make has consequences. For example, I was speaking with someone the other day who was a member of the Freemasons. And he was talking to me all about the Freemasons, trying to sell me on it, as if I don't know anything about what the Freemasons are all about. And at the same time, he's telling me all about how he prays and how he's all about God, et cetera, et cetera. And I was thinking in my head, well, you haven't read The Last Harvest, because if you read the book, you'd understand that the Freemasons have nothing to do with God. They worship Lucifer. We'll get into who he really was. And at a certain point, once you know the information, you have to make a decision. What side are you going to be on? Once you know, you can't say, well, I didn't know. And that's one of the reasons this book was published, so that people can actually make a decision. Because there's a question everyone has to ask themselves. This, what is your nature? Is it light or is it dark? And there's nothing wrong with being dark as if you're dark, okay? So 
In the Bible, in the King James Version, for example, the Divine Father says that he creates both the light and the dark. He creates good and evil. He creates all these things to suit his purposes for balance in his creation. So the issue is not really so much if you are light or dark, but whether your will is in alignment with the Creator or not, in, in alignment with the Creator's will or not. So a being, for example, who is of the light, they can go to the dark, and some of them can return to the light. But if someone is created from the darkness and is a dark being by nature, one can never go to the light. So if it is your desire to seek the light, as many of you at this event claim, then I would suggest, given how short time is, that you should really seek that light with everything you got. And seeking the light does not mean going to a lot of EDM shows or taking yoga retreats with your Eat, Pray, Love book to Bali. That's just self-indulgence. It's actually hard work. Whether light or dark, it's hard work. And if you're a being who is dark in nature, then you also have to understand that you can never go to the light. And there's nothing wrong with that because to try to go to the light would be an exercise in futility and frustration. And the question is, where do you fit in? Because there's two different types of dark. There's dark that rebels against the Creator and dark that does not rebel against the Creator. A common example of that would be the being you know as Satanael, who is often referred to as Satan. He was a fallen angel. He went dark. He's never going back to the light. And although he is dark, he is in rebellion all the time. He has an axe to grind against the Creator. Whereas there are other dark goddesses and beings out there, they're not in that boat. So again, the question is, where do you stand? And this is important to understand this because when you read the material that's in the last harvest, if you don't have a lens like that to look at it, you kind of get confused because most people think like, well, good is good and evil is bad. And on a simple level, that's true. But in a larger picture, things are not that, are not that simple. Now earlier I put human beings in quotes. Why did I do that? I did it because nobody on this planet is actually human. If you go to the Galactic Federation, for example, you have beings over there who would be considered human, but they don't consider you human. Why is that? Well, the answer is that all human beings on this planet at some point were genetically hybridized, specifically with reptilians. So in the process of being hybridized, your free will has been compromised to a degree by design in order to keep you under control. I will get into exactly how it was compromised, by whom. Another idea that's very important here to bring about is this idea that 15% approximately of the population of this planet has RH negative blood. What does that mean? Well, <clears throat> scientists will say that RH negative blood is a factor which is not native to this planet, meaning it's extraterrestrial in nature. Where did it come from? We will cover that. Every president of the United States, RH negative blood. Every member of the Illuminati, RH negative blood. It goes on and on. There's a reason for this. If you have RH negative blood, and it's easy to find out if you do, you can go on Amazon. They actually sell a test, although they're not telling you what the purpose of this test would be, but you can see it determines for only $14.98 with free Amazon Prime shipping, you can tell, well, all your blood types, and you see RH negative is snuck in there. Very useful. So if someone is curious about themselves, if one has an idea like, hmm, I think I've been abducted. I think I may have experiences. I think I may have abilities that are not normal for a regular human being. Well, the first step that you need to do is find out if you're RH negative. Because individuals who have RH negative blood are the number one choice for abduction. Why is that? It's because if you have RH negative blood, you can be hybridized very easily genetically. So an extraterrestrial civilization can, civilization can grab you and they can make modifications to you that are usually not in your best interest, but more in their best interest. And you won't know because you can be abducted, your memories erased. Maybe you have some idea something went wrong. Many people have had these experiences where they think they've been abducted or something strange, but they dismiss it because they go, ah, that can't be. There are plenty of people I've met in my life who are RH negative who had various abilities and superpowers, sort of like what you'd see in X-Men, though not as extreme, okay? Uh, don't get it the wrong way. And these people, they tend to write it off. They say, ah, you know, maybe it's in my mind until something really crazy happens. These individuals have all been hybridized to one degree or another. So if you have RH negative blood, you're very much in demand. If you have RH negative blood and you're also A negative, you're the most in demand. 
However, if you have orange negative blood, good enough too. And yes, not everyone who is abducted and hybridized has orange negative blood, but the majority of them do. And this is very important because if an alien civilization wished to graft their genetics onto this planet to take this planet for themselves, they would need those with RH negative to produce a vehicle by which they could easily put their own genetics on. Because one of these ideas that is, you see in science fiction, like recently on Netflix there was that show Altered Carbon. Has anybody seen that? All right, in Altered Carbon, the basic premise of it is that uh, people's soul and their consciousness can get put onto a chip and be transferred into various genetically modified bodies. So that's 100% fact, just not on this planet, at least you don't know about it. But in other extraterrestrial civilizations, immortality is practically achieved scientifically because a being can just put his soul and his consciousness into another vehicle and continue on as if nothing happened. So most extraterrestrials have very long lifespans to begin with. A Nebu Gray alien has a lifespan of around 20,000 years, a verdant 60,000. Uh, you can imagine when you live that long, you can't be stupid. You really, even if you're dumb, you're gonna acquire so much knowledge and wisdom you can run circles around anyone. Now a human being lives how long? 100 years at best? And after 50, 60 years, you're basically two feet in the grave and too stupid to lie down. Yeah? Let's be honest. Just go to hospitals and nursing homes. What can a human being possibly learn when it only lives 100 years? And this was done by design. Human, being lives, human beings' lives were truncated on purpose because they want to keep you clueless. So this is important to know. Now, I recognize that this is a love and light event for the most part. You don't want me bringing bad vibes. And I almost had to Trojan horse my way into this event. So when they interviewed me for it, I'm like, oh yeah, uh-huh. I'm an experiencer, right? I want to share with people. But now I'm here, so there's nothing you can do about it. You're going to have to put up with me. Someone once told me you can't be evil and stupid. So with that being said, I will not focus too much on the darker aspects of this book. Although, ironically, the darker aspects of the book are the easiest to prove. I mean, half the book is quote after quote of your own leaders saying they're going to kill you. They're not shy about telling you. They're already in a position of such power and strength, they don't care if you know anymore. Plus, you're all on Instagram and TikTok anyway. They don't have to fear you. I mean, you had plenty of time to do something about it, and you didn't. You, what did you do with your free will? Mm, not a whole lot. So now we're in a very awkward situation. So I'm not going to focus on that stuff, even though that stuff would give me a lot more credibility in the eyes of the world because I'm able to prove everything I say. Instead, I'm going to give people more of what they want, which is I'm going to talk about creation, all the extraterrestrial groups. Where did they come from? How did they make you? What were the intergalactic conflicts that made this a reality? So at the very least, you'll be very pleased to realize you're actually living in a bona fide space opera, right? So you watch The Expanse, Farscape, all those shows. Anyone watch those on Sci-Fi Channel? Guess what? You're living in it. That's kind of cool. So I'm hoping that once you learn that lightsabers are actually real and that George Lucas was an insider and knew something, once you know that Death Stars are actually real and out there, and there's actually one close by right now, you just can't see it because it's cloaked, well, maybe that excitement may give you the strength to unpack the darker aspects of the book on your own time, where I don't have to stand around with a box of Kleenex. Another issue is that Planet Nibiru, which is otherwise known as Planet X, it's already here, as I mentioned. Too bad for all of us, it's an Anunnaki Death Star. It's not what people think it is. But then, a lot of things are not what people think they are. <clears throat> so, again, time is short, and uh, there are no saviors. So. I know a lot of people, they like the idea, especially religiously, of a savior coming to save them. Well, nobody's coming. It's just you. It's you and your free will. And what are you going to do with the free will that you do have? Because even though your free will was compromised to a certain degree by design, you still have enough free will to make decisions and to be held responsible. That's one of the reasons this book was written. So people finally have the information where they can start to exercise certain decisions. Now, some people will say to me, and many people have since I've been talking to people here today, well, where does this information come from and who was Lucy and Mars? So here's the answer that's going to make you all look at me like this. Okay? 
Lucian Mars is an ambassador sent from the dark mother goddess Lucifera and an interdimensional reptilian member of the hierarchy under her. A lot of you will be like, oh my, have you been watching too much science fiction? Well, just think about it. If you talk to the rest of the world about your experiences here that you hold true to yourself, they're going to look at you the same way. You're going to be like, abducted by aliens? What are you crazy? Get a life. You need therapy. You're probably molested as a kid. It goes on and on. All they do is invalidate you. So I'm just going to say, if you want to invalidate me, just don't do it now. Do it later after you've read the book and heard the whole story because I will explain all this. And um, this, of course, naturally there's a problem because like I said earlier, I can go right now on Amazon, again Amazon, thank you Jeff Bezos, and I can show you this book written by the Department of Defense, okay? It's not written by Random House or Penguin. This is the DOD. And in this book, they tell you exactly how they plan to operate the concentration camps that they built in North America to put you in. And you know how many of them there are? They're enough right now to hold 30 million of you. And guess what? You paid for it all. Wow, that's a great feeling when you pay your taxes. Why do you think you pay your taxes and the roads still don't work? Nothing works around you because all that money is going into black projects. They're building underground cities, finding ways to get to Mars, and building concentration camps to stick you in. So again, this is an example of if I make a statement such as there are concentration camps built to house you, I can back that up. Because I can say, here, go on Amazon. It's not even hard and buy it. It's published by the Department of Defense. They tell you in great detail how they run these camps. It's very disturbing to read it. Again, not conspiracy theory. It's written by your own government. They don't care anymore. They just put it out in front of you. It's not a big deal. Luckily for me, my mission is not an impossible one. Because clearly I can't prove to you that Lucifer was an alpha draconian reptilian genetic engineer. You're going to just have to take my word for it, okay? I'm not asking you to sign some document that says that you believe it. I'm not asking you to give me some money because you believe it. It's just, you're going to have to accept it in order to enjoy the presentation. And <laughs> the thing is, I'm of the belief that when you tell someone the truth about what's really going on, part of them is always like, ooh, yeah. Even if they want to resist it, they say, ah, I don't like that. I don't agree with it. It makes me feel uncomfortable. It makes me angry. It's like a virus. It's in your mind. You can't get it out. And one day, you're going to be like, oh, you're going to have a different framework where someone will say something, you'll see something, you'll be like, that sounds exactly what Damien was talking about. Hmm, maybe I should think some more about it. So this is how it goes. Another thing that helps me out a lot when dealing with the credibility issue is that one of the targeted demographics for this book is RH negative individuals. See, RH ne negative individuals might be only 15% of the world population, but what percentage of the population do you think they are at this event? It's higher than that. A lot of you here are RH negative. Half of you have probably been abducted. You talk about it all the time. So you should be paying attention. And you're also going to be a lot more open to this information, even though you may have been digesting a whole lot of what I would call nonsense for the last 15, 20 years in the local New Age bookshops, it's still going to be very interesting. Um, and I think my job may be a little bit easier. Finally, before I start, I want to say I have nothing to sell you. Now, some of you smarties will be like, well, your book is for sale on Amazon. Yeah, it is. But this weekend, it's free. You want a copy? You just come and get it from me. Again, uh, publishing does not make money these days. I don't. So I have nothing to sell you, which helps me a lot, I think, in credibility. And I'm probably actually the only vendor here who's not selling anything. You come by my booth, I'm like, hey, what's up? <laughs> People don't know what to do with that. Other vendors come and go, you're ruining it for us. What are you doing? Sell something, please. You're making us look bad. <clears throat> Another thing I want to state is that I don't represent any human religion whatsoever, nor am I trying to create another one. I will be talking about the Divine Father, the Creator. I will be talking about goddesses. I will be talking about a lot of elements which are you will see in religions on this planet. But I have no interest in any human religions. I'm not trying to create another one. I say that because a lot of times someone will write a book and reveal a certain amount of truth because they want to win your confidence so then they can take advantage of you, create a cult, do something like this. I have no interest in this. When it comes to religion, people can believe whatever they want. I do not care. However, we should remember that religion is an artificial impediment to direct communication with your creator, the Divine Father. If you were to pray to your creator and talk to him, nothing's going to stop you from doing that. 
It's not like, oh, sorry, you're not part of religion, you can't pray to me. It's ridiculous. So don't worry about that. Don't worry about form and function because it's going to become very important going forward because when you really learn all this information that's in the last harvest, you're going to be like, okay, but what do I do? This is crazy. And that's when praying comes into effect. And I'm not saying that from a Christian point of view, a religion point of view. It is what it is. You don't want to call it prayer, call it communication. So, so here's an example. I put down over two slides because it's so big. And you have a handout to help you follow along because I don't know if people in the back can actually read this. So the purpose of this chart is for me to go over a lot of the backstory of creation and the universe in order to create the context to really understand what's going on right now. Because if I tell you, hey, guess what? The elite are planning to kill 90% of you. You'd be like, that's rather rude. Or you'd be like, well, but why would they do that? And then I say, well, it's because it's the agenda of the Nebu Gray aliens who control this planet. And that brings the question, well, okay, well, I need to really need to know some backstory here because there's obviously a lot going on they never told me about. And you'd be 100% correct in that regard. And again, if someone doesn't believe in aliens or extraterrestrials, we have to keep in mind a few things. The elite who are in charge of this planet, they believe in all this, whether you do or not. And they're acting as if it is correct. As a matter of fact, NASA has a lot of laws on the books governing your contact with extraterrestrials. They're actually reprinted in the back of the last harvest. So I know the government likes to waste money and buy $1,000 toilets and things like this, but um, do you really think they'd be writing laws to govern the contact with extraterrestrials if they weren't any? It's, it's, it goes on and on. As a matter of fact, the other uh, three weeks ago in Congress, a congresswoman testified in front of everyone. She was former military. She says, yes, uh, extraterrestrials exist. I've seen the bodies. I've seen the craft. This is one of your Congress people. So what, you think she's delusional? No, more and more comes out. When I was a child and I went to the Hayden Planetarium in New York City, the announcer of the star show on the ceiling would say, and of course, we are the only intelligent life in the universe. How could you even think there's anything else? And blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there as a kid going, it doesn't really quite make sense. This is a big universe. I'm sure there's somebody else out there. It can't just be us. Some years later, you go now and you hear, Neil deGrasse Tyson, who I'm no fan of, and he's narrating the star show, and he's like, of course we're not the only life forms in the universe. How could you think of something so retarded? I'm like, you know, 25 years ago, you were saying that same retarded stuff. <laughs> so we're here. So at the top of the chart, we start with the almighty, all-sourceful father. You want to call him God. You want to call him the creator. That's fine. And I have a quote there from the King James Version of the Bible that says, I form the light and create the darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things. And I reiterate that so, again, people understand that light and dark is in a perpetual struggle in creation, trying to attain balance and ultimately driving evolution forward. And I'm not talking about a Darwinian sort of evolution. We'll just leave it as evolution. To help guide you along, the friends I put in green, the foes I put in red. All subject to change, just kidding. Um, so at the top here, we have some of the, the major players. So a lot of people like David Icke will say that the reptilians are the oldest race in creation. They're not. The oldest race are called the Magians. And the Magians are um, a tall, blue-skinned type of humanoid. Um, devoid for the most part of emotions or much interest in sex. They don't reproduce a lot. And their main interest is technology and destruction. And they're all vampiric in nature. We talk about vampirism a lot in this book because the idea of vampirism comes generally from reptilian culture. And the idea of werewolves comes from the uh, wolf and Anunnaki. And I'll get into that later. But for now, I just want to point out that the original oldest race in creation of the Magians they're all vampiric in nature, and by that I don't mean that they drink blood, but they suck the life force out of everything. And um, they are technically sort of a, a threat to everyone. The only reason that they are not creating more, how should I say, problems in creation is because there aren't that many of them, um, which is probably lucky for everybody else. Then over here we have the second oldest race in creation. That's the reptilians. 
And the biggest reptilian empire, the one that's one of the biggest uh, empires out there, is the Siakar Empire. It used to be known as the Orion Empire, and after that it was called the Aryan Empire. So when you see a lot of uh, books written like Shining the Light, I forget the author of that book series, he wrote it in the 90s, he'll talk about this. Uh, there are some other references, uh, a few of them, that talk about the Orion and the, um, the uh, Aryan Empire. And most of the information was extracted from uh, a computer that was on a spacecraft that was downed on an Indian reservation. I believe it was Robert Morning Sky, who was the Native American who found this extraterrestrial, who was not reptilian. And uh, this, this extraterrestrial shared a lot of this data. So all the information that's regurgitated over and over prior to the publication of this book has to do with the corrupted information that was in that computer system, for lack of a better word. So over here we have the Galactic Federation. A lot of people, especially these love and light events, they love to talk about the Galactic Federation as if they're coming to save you and rescue you. Well, they're not. Uh, and um, they're, they are currently allied with the Siakar Empire. They're allies right now because they have common interests in that call extraterrestrial civilizations. They really want this planet and we're just in the way. Um, they want the planet for its resources and its proximity in the galaxy is good for intergalactic trade. And we have to keep this in mind. We live on this planet, we have this idea like there's nothing going on out there when there's this, all this stuff going on and we're just not allowed to see it. Uh, if you look up in the sky right now, there's so many craft, but they're all cloaked. You can't see them. So when if someone does see a UFO that's either a reverse engineered US government piece of junk or it's a craft by the Nebu Gray that came out from inside the hollow earth or out from under the ocean, and they allow you to see it, but if they don't want to be seen, you're not going to be seen. So the Galactic Federation is a federation of planet systems and alien races. It has a large what we call human component. The reptilian Siakar Empire is, well, reptilian. And the leader, the ruler of the reptilian Siakar Empire is a goddess by the name of Lucifera. And Lucifera is interesting because, well, for many reasons, but within the context of this presentation, she is the original colonizer of Earth. The reptilians were the first to colonize this planet. They had pushed it out of orbit. It used to be further away from the sun. It was more watery. They pushed it over. And the very first settlers on this planet were the Nagas. They were the first ones to arrive here. And sometimes people ask, well, what were the dinosaurs on this planet for? Does that have something to do with reptilians? The answer is, I'm sure we've all heard that the Native Americans had roaming herds of buffalo everywhere, which they ate. Well, guess what reptilians like to eat? Dinosaurs. So all those dinosaurs roaming the planet were food. And the reason the dinosaurs went extinct is because the Pleiadians were very annoyed at the fact that the reptilians had laid claim to this planet first. So they got a bunch of their criminal element, which were called the Atlans. They said, you go to that planet and make a lot of trouble for those Nagas over there. And one of the things they did was wipe out the dinosaurs. Because what did we do when we took this country from the Indians? We killed their food supply. We ran around on trains, shot all the buffalo. That's how you do it. So the Atlans did the same thing, and they really aggravated the Nagas, who they went to war with. We'll get into that later. So now, the, um, the other big player here is what we call the Nebu Gray, otherwise known as the Shetu Grays. They're a reptoid av avian-based creation. They're the ones who really plan on taking this planet for themselves. They love to abduct humans for hybridization and slavery. Eisenhower signed a treaty with them. The Russians did shortly thereafter. Every side being promised uh, advanced technology to get an advantage over the other nation in exchange for the right to abduct people. And Eisenhower, of course, never asked you what you thought about it. He just went ahead and did it. And they said, oh, you represent humanity? OK, you can speak for them. Really? And he did. And what started out, well, we just need to abduct a few people to, for their genetic information in order to save us because we're dying race and all that junk that the Nebu Gray is always saying, which they use on every planet. Oh, we're you from the future. We're come here to warn you. We hurt ourselves in a nuclear war. We're here to help you. No, it's a game. It's not, it's not real. So anyway, um, I think in the last, there's some organizations, we quote them in the last harvest, and there have been over 5 million people disappearing in like the last 20 years alone. Where did they all go? onto someone's dinner table on a spaceship. They get hybridized and sold on the intergalactic slave market. So when people talk about human trafficking, they don't know what's going on out there. They have no idea. 
So the Nebu Gray Empire and the reptilian Siakar Empire, they're sworn enemies. Although ironically, what we call the Nebu Gray were actually created genetically engineered by the Siakar Empire. You see how complicated your history gets. It's, we've only begun. And you won't see this in any other book anywhere. You just won't. So one of the big events that um, shaped this planet is that at one point the Magians were a threat to both the Siakar Empire and the Sarayan-based Wolf and Anunnaki Empire. And these two hate each other like cat and dog by nature. Why do they not get along? Let's explore that. Well, first of all, the reptilian civilization is a matriarchy. And by that, it's not because one day they decided to say, hey, it'd be a good idea if women ruled us. No, that's not why. On this planet, why do we have a patriarchy? It's very simple. The reason this planet is patriarchal is, is because males are physically stronger than females. This is an issue. This is not an issue in the reptilian empire because the females in the reptilian empire, they all have venom. <laughs> doesn't matter if you're stronger, faster. They just spray venom on you and you're gone. They don't have to bite you. It's, it's venom like you don't know on this planet. And they spray it and it's your end of day for you. And they can spray at great distances. They just put some saliva on a blade and paper cut you. It's game over. So when you have the females with this level of power on a biological level, they're going to dominate. So some of you feminists might be like, oh, tell me more about this. <laughs> but that's the reality. <laughs> Meanwhile, you have the Sarayan Wolfen who created the Anunnaki. They're a patriarchy. They have that belief, oh, women are just for breeding. They should be in the kitchen. They literally act that way. And um, you can imagine that a culture where the women are like, hey, we spew venom. And then this other culture is like, ah, oh, you belong in the kitchen. This isn't going to work out. But when you're threatened by the Magians, who have technology that is so out of control, well, you guys better get together and uh, team up. So Lucifera, she had a marriage of convenience with an individual named King Anu, which is where the term Anunnaki comes from. It's King Anu's creations. And they got together to unite against the Magians. And this created a problem because Lucifera had a son. That son's name was Lucifer. Now, this is an important thing we need to bring out. In modern religion or theology, you're taught that Satan, Lucifer, and the devil are three names for the same being. It's not the case. There are three entirely different beings that got conflagrated together in order to keep you more confused. So the difference between these beings, just for the record also, is that while Lucifer and Satan rebel against the Divine Father, the devil actually does not. So this is a big fundamental difference between them. So another thing I need to point out here is that Lucifera, when she reproduces, and reptilians have eggs, if a male fertilizes her eggs, the offspring is always female. But if her eggs are inspirited by the Divine Father, we have a male entity that comes from her. And that's where we get beings such as Lucifer, Jesus, various angels, the Elohim, anyone whose name ends in L. When you read the Bible, you read ancient literature and someone's name ends in L, they are a product of Lucifer's eggs being divinely inspirited by the Divine Father as opposed to being inseminated by a male drone. It produces a very different type of being. These beings have a very different nature. Um, so, Lucifer was scheduled to inherit the throne, for lack of a better word, a lack of, lack of a better way to say it. However, since Lucifer married King Anu, now he basically lost his right to the throne. He's not happy with this, yeah? It's actually King Anu's son, Prince Enlil. We've all heard of Enki and Enlil in mythology and history. Everyone's heard those terms. Well, guess who Enki is? Lucifer. Just another name. So Enki and Enlil, they didn't like each other. We know why. So Lucifer's idea, I'll call him Lucifer instead of Enki, just to be very clear about it, was he always said with every waking moment of his day, what can I do to make life harder for Enlil? And at the same time, Lucifer had this idea. He said, well, if I can't have my kingdom in the reptilian Siakar Empire, maybe I can create a 
kingdom here on this planet and rule over all the beings on it. He had some ideas. He was a genetic re-engineer, and that's what he did. Um, he wasn't a warrior type of being. Uh, he was more of a scientist. So it's important to point out here that the concept of, like I said earlier, vampires comes from the reptilian culture because a lot of those females, they have fangs, they drink blood, and they're vampiristic in nature, much like the Magians. But not all reptilians are, just a certain class of them. And the Anunnaki, the story of the werewolves comes from them because their countenance is lion-like. There's some drawings that one will see. Um, I should have put one in the presentation where they are shown on Indian temple walls what they look like. And they, they look like werewolves, and they're all cannibals. They eat each other. They eat their captured people in war. They eat the dead. The, they don't need rations as an army because they just eat everything around them. And they're terrifying. So the concept of the werewolf comes from there. So I'm sure you've seen uh, the Underworld film franchise with Kate Beckinsale, right, with the lichens versus the, the vampires and all that. This is based loosely on this idea. What's interesting about the Underworld series is it talks a lot about the idea of hybridization. What happens when you hybridize these creatures? So hybrids, the idea of hybridizing um, creations is a, a very interesting one because when you hybridize a creation, the result of that hybridization is more powerful than the two beings that went into it. And so various extraterrestrial civilizations are always engaged in hybridization. If you want someone to mine an asteroid, you have to design a physical form that can operate in the vacuum of space. Um, and then you can put consciousness or a soul into it, and it's a slave. You can have it work. If you wish to create a super soldier or a being like that, you can genetically modify a being for those purposes as well. The, one of the reasons that the Nebu Gray aliens, the greys we all know about, is so angry all the time, and really they're, they're, they're not a happy bunch, is because they were one of Lucifer's first creations. They were created as slaves, given that metalloid sort of body they have, and very small because they were working in mines. So when people say, well, why are the Freemasons called the Freemasons? They say, oh, because we were stone cutters who worked with stones and built the pyramids. No, you didn't build the pyramids. Lucifer did. But it's kind of a half-truth because the Nebu Gray were actually stone cutters. They were genetically engineered to work in mines. But they ended up rebelling. And that created a problem that still exists to this day. So this sibling rivalry created a lot of different creations. So Lucifer, he was out engineering various races of human beings. And so um, what's interesting about Enlil is that he went under another name. His name was Yahweh because he thought it was a great idea to impersonate the Divine Father. He wanted to play God. So when you have technology that is a hundred million years more advanced than ours, actually several hundred million years, you will appear to other beings as if you were godlike. You're certainly recreating life, which you can easily say, I'm creating life even though you're not. And Yahweh is not the Divine Father. Yahweh is actually Enlil. So the Anunnaki were, and the Wolfen were making a lot of other very interesting beings, too many to name, a lot of them which were created with no sense for what these beings would do, the havoc they would wreck, um, what their future would be. There is not a lot of morality or ethics. Like on this planet, we have people who talk about, oh, what are the, the ethics of selecting my child's eye color? We should make this illegal. Ridiculous. You think extraterrestrial civilizations have those issues? No, they do whatever they want. So two of their most famous creations were the Nephilim. A very bad idea, because the Nephilim were running around eating everything on the planet. They were giants and cannibals. And they made life very difficult. So when you see shows like the Japanese anime Attack on Titan. Anyone seen that? Probably, right? People very, when you see Attack on Titan, there's something inside of you that's very disturbed when you see those cannibalistic giants. Most people experience that. Why does this show successful? Show so successful. Why do I feel this way when I watch it? It's actually a genetic memory. You're remembering the Nephilim because that's what they did. They just ran around grabbing you and eating you. Pretty disturbing when you think about this. As a matter of fact, this angered the Divine Father so much, which is why he brought the flood onto this planet. It was basically like flushing a toilet on a lot of these really messed up creations. He's saying, what are you guys doing? You can't just be running willy-nilly, making whatever you want. 
Another type of being that was engineered by the Wolf and Anunnaki were the Valduri Corpus Void, which over time transform into the Valduri Scalati. So I'm sure a lot of you have heard of Santa Muerte. People worship her in Mexico and this sort of thing. She is one of those beings, and incidentally, she's not a she. She's actually a male. But considering her form is skeletal, it doesn't really matter what the gender is. It doesn't. So beings like this, people always wonder, where did they come from? They were created with genetic engineering where no one was thinking about the consequences of what they were creating. So, what so what's interesting is when he was genetically engineering human beings, the way he did it, and this is why I put humans in quotes, is he took the humanoids that were on this planet, I guess you could call them hominids maybe, or apes, and he crossed them with the genetics of various reptilian species. So now, when he hybridized these human beings, he didn't use the genetic information from living reptilian beings. He took it from dead ones. So he created a kind of creature that's sort of undead. Now, why do you think shows like The Walking Dead are so popular? Why is it that in the last 20 years there must have been one billion zombie films made and zombie TV shows? Where is this coming from? Again, we go back to genetic memory. It's because all of us are really kind of zombies in the literal sense. This is why he did it. The problem is that the extraterrestrials who control this planet, they're not out in space anymore. They're inside the Earth because the Earth is hollow. All planets are hollow on the inside. Some people say, what? Okay, listen, why do you think in recent years there's been this giant resurgence of the flat Earth movement? Everyone's always talking about how the planet is flat, almost maniacal about it. Where would that come from? Well, the reason is those who run the show here don't want you to know the reality. So there's a reason why all the countries on this planet signed the Antarctic Treaty to agree to never go to Antarctica, and they all respect that treaty. Okay, when in history has there ever been a situation where every country on the planet is respecting some treaty? Especially when it's like, oh, don't go explore this place that could have all these valuable resources. No way. There's a reason why no one goes down there anymore. And it's because the beings who live inside the hollow earth will kill you. So it's that simple. They say, you're not coming down here? You ain't going down there. No, 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 no. So, another thing we need to think about here is that life exists on all planets, not only on the surface or inside of it or even between the surface and the hollow earth, because we have all these underground cities and deep underground military bases and maglev trains crisscrossing under the planet, which a lot of people know about, but we also have life on different dimensions on the same planet. So right now we're sitting here in this room and there's maybe 50 different radio stations going by here, but we don't hear them. If we have a radio, we tune it, we can hear them. Well, guess what? Creation's like that too. So if you switch frequencies a bit, you could be in the same space in a different realm. That's how you can have spirits and entities and et cetera, et cetera, because they could be in the room with you. You can't see them or touch them, but they can see you and touch you. So a lot of uh, activity is occurring inside the planet as well as on the surface on different levels. So it, as it turns out, the Nebu Gray Empire that is in control on this inside of the planet, they're in a bit of a different dimension. But the dimension that they're in is very close to the dimension of the dead. So I don't want to get too deep into these topics, but for example, when people say, well, does hell exist? Yes, it does. There are many types of hell. When we talk about the idea of hell, a human being can be, or any sort of being, regardless of what they are, can be reincarnated, for example, onto a planet where life is very miserable. I'm sure you could say that that would be a type of hell. Same way you could be reincarnated onto a planet where life's pretty good. That would be kind of like a type of heaven. That doesn't mean there aren't, aren't actual hells, actual dimensions where beings are placed and they suffer, where dark beings live. And there are many different hells because you can't send every type of creation into the same hell. Some creatures would be like, I like this human hell. It doesn't bother me at all. So you have to send them somewhere else, yeah? But human beings, they get to send to their hell. So all this is important. Why am I saying this? Because in order for humans to be controlled very easily, you would have to create a link between us up here on the surface and the inner earth in a different dimension where your controllers live. The best way to do that 
is through the realm of the dead. You anchor the human beings into the realm of the dead. And you do that by genetically hybridizing them with the material, genetic material of dead reptilians. This is where the unconscious mind comes from. So when you hear about Freud and all the psychiatries, psychiatric community always talking about the unconscious mind and all that, and, oh, I don't know, when I was a child, I wasn't loved enough, and now as a result, I'm always seeking out relationships where I'm also not loved. We all acknowledge this is a real problem. I mean, how many books are in the self-help section trying to figure out what to do about the fact that you don't have control over your conscious mind? I mean, this is a huge issue. So the natural question that comes out was, well, do other extraterrestrial species have an unconscious mind? No, only you do. So what Lucifer did when he was genetically re-engineering people was very clever but also very nasty because now you have a huge part of your consciousness that you don't have access to. But guess who has access to it? Those who control you. And this is why human beings are so easy to influence. They're always going to war. They never learn. How many humans have a very high IQ and are emotionally retarded and continuously do things that are not in their best interest? Clearly your free will has been somewhat compromised. And this is the guy who did it because that's what he did. He gave you an unconscious mind. And that's one of the reasons that humans are so easily manipulated. This is why I put human beings in quotes because you're all hybridized to some degree or another regardless of whether you have RH negative blood or not. And this is what makes humans on Earth very different from the humans found in the Galactic Federation. It's also one of the reasons why all those extraterrestrial civilizations, they don't like you. They want nothing to do with you because from their point of view, you're irredeemable. There's nothing that can be done with you. You're genetically a mistake. And I know that sounds very harsh, but it is what it is, and you don't have to believe it. It doesn't mean that they aren't extraterrestrial groups that are trying to get people off this planet, but guess who they're trying to get off? They're trying to find RH negative people, people who've been hybridized, that they can adapt into their civilization. You think they're gonna pull your local gangbanger off the street and put him in the, on the Galactic Federation? This is ridiculous, no. They're looking for people who have genetics that are valuable, and not all hybrids are valuable. A lot of hybrids, you can't do anything with them. If someone was hybridized to be a professional killer, what are you gonna do with them, right? It's an issue. What do you do with people like this? A lot of them, they just have to put them down. Not to mention that there are a lot of beings on this planet who aren't human. They walk around in a human body, because people who are hybridized will always run into other people. Why do I connect with that person so much? Most people who are hybridized, they don't get along with other people. How many people in this room feel like they don't get along with generally the people out there in the world? There's a reason for it. It's because just like a mother of an animal recognizes that those children are not from her litter and wants to kill them, other human beings are not entirely stupid. They can smell, or for lack of a better word, detect that you are not right. They're looking at you and they're like, well, that person might be very attractive, but there's something wrong with them. And they're not wrong. They know. So they're, they're cautious. And listen, if you're RH negative female and you reproduce with a male who's not RH negative, your kids are going to come out usually with autism or something very wrong with them because these blood types are not meant to mix. And scientists and doctors will tell you that. They know, that's why they're checking for the RH negative blood type in mothers who are pregnant, because they know what happens. They don't know why, but they know. And when you're born, they're checking whether you're RH negative, why? Because the controllers of this planet want to know where you all are, because you're valuable. You don't want to let them run around. And back in the day, they would let you know, but now they pretend, oh, we don't check for that. Yeah, sure you do, of course you do. So <clears throat> what's interesting here is, well, where did the Illuminati come from, the New World Order, all these beings? I mentioned to you earlier that the Atlans created Atlantis, and they were always fighting with the Nagas, who at the time had a civilization in Lemuria before they all went into the Hollow Earth, where they all are now today. And we all know that Atlantis and Lemuria, they brawled it out in both continents, whoop, whoop, under the water. Well, what? the question is, how did Atlantis end up doing such crazy things? Well. A lot of these particular creations of Lucifer, the albino Kingu Babar hybridized Caucasians, they somehow found their way into Atlantis. And I guess they were very attractive or something, but they ended up breeding with the Atlans. And that created a problem. Because the resulting, the resultant of that procreation created a type of being that was um, highly problematic. 
and they very quickly took over Atlantis, just like they've taken over this planet now. And once they took over Atlantis, well, that was a big issue because they're doing a lot of wacky things. And after Atlantis sank, those individuals who survived, they went on to become the Illuminati. And the Illuminati took on the name Temple of the Sun, the Freemasons, and finally the New World Order. And they still worship Lucifer, even though Lucifer is not around anymore. But that's another story. But they don't know that, and they still worship him. On the surface, they say, oh, they into God, or they come up, pretend they're Christians or whatever, but they're not. They worship Lucifer. Um, and it makes sense, because from their point of view, he was the creator. So this Illuminati, they've usurped control of Atlantis, just like they now have usurped control of Earth. And they do it with the help of the Nebu Gray. The Nebu Gray love it when other people do their dirty work for them. Because why should we kill everyone? I'll just get the Illuminati and the elite to kill you all off. We'll tell them, yeah, hey, Bill Gates, buy up all that land with all the drinking water and the, the uh, cattle on it. Because when we get to, to rule, all, rule over all of this, yeah? Uh, the problem is what Bill Gates and a lot of these elite don't know is that as soon as they've done their job, they're being killed next. Because this is what the Nebu Gray do. It's part of their playbook. They did it historically with Marduk. We go into great detail in the book about that. And uh, when they were done with him, they buried him under the Great Pyramid. Well, maybe. Either way, he's dead. Who knows where his body is? But they took care of him. They didn't need him anymore. And he realized too late that he'd been manipulated and played. So the question comes up, well, where does RH negative blood come from? The answer is RH negative blood is from those survivors of Atlantis, the hybrids who cross themselves with the Atlans. That's the source of RH negative blood. So anyone who's RH negative blood, your physical vehicle has the genetic material from those people. And that's why you're so valuable. That's why everyone goes after you. Because they know they can do all kinds of cool stuff with you, right? So <clears throat> while the Illuminati was doing their thing, the Wolf and Anunnaki ultimately set up camp in ancient Egypt and they worship Enlil. And they like to pretend they built the Great Pyramids, but the Great Pyramids were actually built by Lucifera. Now, why do they like to say this? Well, because now that they're no longer aligned with the reptilian Sudhikar Empire, they can go back to their chauvinistic, patriarchal ways and be all as misogynistic as they want. They say, oh, those, those females didn't make that stuff. No, we did, yeah, yeah. No, it wasn't exactly what happened. So they go around saying that, and a lot of times when you see Artwork and reliefs, you'll see this in like Sumeria and Babylon where you have a sphinx lion-like creature and it's stomping on a serpent. Many people have probably seen that. It's a common image you see it in museums. That is an image that is Wolf and Anunnaki. And what it symbolizes is them conquering their reptilian nature. Because the truth about <clears throat> the Wolf and Anunnaki, as much as they may hate the matriarchal reptilian Siakar empire, is that they are a serpent-based genetic as well but they don't like that part of themselves. So they like to pretend like they overcame it. And they're, um, they have that male kind of delusion about greatness. <laughs> so this um, has always been this conflict between Enlil's progeny, because Enlil is long gone, still competing with the creations of Lucifer, who's also not so long gone, but gone as well. And um, what happened at a certain point in history, which led to the mess we have today, is of course the Nebu Gray, who rebelled and were on their own, they approached certain queens, lesser queens, who were part of the reptilian Siakar Empire, who had been charged with running this place, just like if you had a corporation and you put a, a couple female executives in charge. And the Nebu Gray came to them and said, listen, you don't really have a lot of a opportunities for advancement in your empire currently. How about we all get together and just take this planet for ourselves, right? And they said, eh, hey, that sounds like a good idea, right? So <laughs> they're traitors. They betrayed Lucifera and the reptilian Siakar Empire, broke away, joined up with the Nebu Gray. They actually teamed up with the remaining Anunnaki, and they've kind of have a stranglehold on this planet. And they run everything, and the elite basically just do their bidding. So all these secret societies we have where people are doing all sorts of wackiness that you read about, it's all basically tied into that. Now, if we come over here, we go down a little bit, um, 
We can see that, again, I, like I mentioned, the uh, Temple of the Sun, the uh, Illuminati, Atlantis, they went to war against the Nagas in the, that are now in Agarthia, who were, at, who were in Lemuria at the time. Both continents sunk. Uh, the biblical flood that destroyed the firmament and caused all that flooding and flushed the um, Nephilim and all the others down the drain, although the, some did survive. Uh, that occurred. And what happens is interesting is in the Bible when Noah built the ark, that's because Noah was one of Lucifer's children. One of his, Lucifer liked having sex with human females. I mean, he really, that was his thing. Um, yeah, I guess we can understand that. But, um, and he had a lot of children. And one of them was Noah. So of course, when he knew that the planet was getting flushed down the toilet, he's like, oh, I better go tell Noah, hey, this is what happening. So Noah's like, oh, I better build this ark here. So now the ark wasn't the wooden boat, OK? So people searching for that, no, it's not a wooden boat. But, uh, Either way, that's what happened. So what happened to the Illuminati ultimately? Well, many of them have fled inside the Earth, or they've gone actually to Mars. And there are wars that are going on on Mars right now that they're losing, uh, because all the extraterrestrial civilizations that are around here watching this unfold, who all want this planet as well for themselves, and humans really are inconsequential to them, they will not let these extraterrestrial groups get off this planet. So we have a situation where it's kind of like the Alamo, where this is the last stand. And this makes the situation very dangerous because if you're an extraterrestrial group and you have nowhere to go because you'll be killed and this is your planet and you want it for yourself, you're capable of doing some nasty things. They have, really they don't have an ethical or moral compass like humans may or may not have, right? Um, and this becomes an issue. The questions humans don't ask, because humans get so caught up in religion, whether they're Christians, Jews, or Muslim, they all very fanatical, without realizing that, listen, if you're going to be a good person, just be a good person. You really need someone to teach you how to be a good person? Maybe you do, but there are other ways to learn how to be a good person, right? You can take an ethics class at college. I'm not trying to knock anyone's religion. I'm just trying to point out that there's nothing to stop you from praying to the Divine Father. You don't need a religion for that. You don't need a religion to be a good person. If you want to be religious, that's fine. Nothing wrong with that. But keep in mind that this came from somewhere. And when you look back in history, how many wars do we have based on religion? Even now, we see in Israel the same thing going up again. Uh, Islam is Judaism versus Islam. You want to call it Hamas versus Israel. It's all the same thing. Before that, you had the Crusades. This is endless religious wars. Now, do you really think that the Divine Father who said, thou shalt not kill, is a fan of killing in his name? No, he's not. He says clearly he isn't. So basic logic, it's a problem. So what happened to the Nazis at the end? A lot of them fled to Antarctica, into the hollow earth, and actually out into space. So if you ever see that show on Netflix, uh, Iron Sky, anybody seen that? No one's seen Iron Sky. It's a comedy, but it's, huh? Uh, but it's based on reality. This actually happened. So again, I recognize very clearly that a lot of what I've said, I can't prove any of this to you. I can't. I can prove to you a lot of other things that are in the book, but this aspect of the material I can't prove. Because the first half of The Last Harvest covers the intergalactic history, the exopolitics, and the true history of this planet. But what the second half of The Last Harvest covers is what is happening on this planet now and stands to have the greatest impact on you. Because while it's nice to know that lightsabers do exist, they do. The Death Star actually exists. It comes from the Siakar Empire. Um, it really doesn't benefit you now other than give you entertainment. And it gives you context to understand what's going on now. Because now you know a lot more about why the Nebu Gray want to kill you. They, you know why people are abducted. No one ever knows. You think they're abducting you to probe you or some ridiculous thing? No. They, 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 it's not like they have, they're a bunch of degenerates. They don't care about that. They're, abducting you for a really good reason. So while the first half of this book can definitely be classified as speculative, the second half, no, that's not the case. Here we got, oh, it looks like the screen didn't translate properly. Something wrong with the software. So anyway, for example, um, the plan reduced the world population by 90%. Here we have the Global 2000 report, 1980 report commissioned by President Jimmy Carter talks about advocating depopulating the planet to the 500 million level. I can prove that. You can go find that report. That was already, Jimmy Carter was a long time ago, yeah? Look at this, Catherine Austin Fitz. That's a real person. I can prove she exists. Former Assistant Secretary to George Herbert Walker Bush, 
Oh, look, she's also talking about depopulating the planet down to five in a million. Wow, that number keeps coming up a lot. Oh, what's this? Former U.S. Secretary of State Robert McNamara? What? He's also talking about taking down the population? Kissinger? Gorbachev? It goes on and on. They're not shy about it. Now, if all your world leaders are saying this, I think you should pay attention. There's something going on. You can't say, oh, Damien made that up. These aren't my words. This isn't even the words of Lucy and Mars. This is the words of your own leaders and your elite. And what's interesting is that just like the number of 500 million keeps coming up, or equivalent, the idea of the year 2025 keeps coming up. It shows up over and over. If we talk about the idea that uh, by 2025, an unprecedented, th unprecedented threat would materialize. Uh, we talk about the US Air Force Symposium. What this is, the quote is cut off, is that they said by 2025, they'll have total control over the weather, which means they can create famines and genocides at will. So why go to war with another country when you can just starve them out by altering the weather and destroying them? And already, we have massive amounts of weather control in place. M none of the weather is natural at this point. So over and over, we see these numbers occurring. 2025, that's right around the corner. That's like a year and a half from now. Some people say, well, why 2025? Is that some sort of magic occult number? No, that's just the number when probably all the underground bases are done. So they don't need you anymore. They needed your tax dollars to build these bases to pay for them. They're not paying for it themselves, right? Human beings no longer really need it. The Industrial Revolution is over. At this point, what are you going to do? They don't need billions of people on TikTok and Facebook hanging out all day. Yeah, you're in the way. Time to go. <laughs> so what are these vectors of depopulation? Well, the first one is nuclear war. Before I left New York City, um, they were running public service ads on the subway and on the TV, what to do in case of a nuclear attack. Is there something you guys know about that I need to know about? What are you talking about? And then their response was, well, yeah, if there ever is a nuclear attack, just go into the center of whatever building you're in and you'll be okay. I'm like, I don't think that's how nuclear attacks work. But it's the city of New York, so I mean, anything's possible, right? We see in the, in the Ukraine what's going on between Putin and, the, and, the, and uh, the rest of the world. Putin, you can go right now on YouTube and find YouTube videos of Putin live in front of an audience explicitly saying that if NATO keeps encroaching or if the US gets involved anymore, he will start using nuclear weapons without hesitation. Wow, that's pretty impressive. I mean, he has children. You really think like, if you're a parent, you have children, you think it's a good idea to start dropping nukes everywhere? especially the amount of nukes we have. This is problematic. And now we have the situation in what's going on in, uh, in Gaza, where again, we have things getting ready for another massive world war. We have examples where the United States thinks it's a cool idea to send all the military industrial complex salespeople into Taiwan and to sail military vessels in the waters between China and Taiwan. Like, really? We need wars on every front? What's going on? It's like they're up to something. And one has to be very careful because, like I said, when nuclear war is being advertised so flagrantly, that's a problem. And you have to understand that all the world's leaders are under control. The same mechanism by which you have an unconscious mind, you can be possessed at any moment by a Nebu Gray or any other extraterrestrial. It's problematic. And this is an issue when you talk about channeling. And people, like a lot of people here, they channel. And there's nothing wrong with that. I'm not trying to make a comment about it. But you always have to ask yourself, well, what are you channeling? Who's talking to you? That's a big issue. If you don't know, you could be in a lot of problems because you can be led astray, for starters. Um, at one point, uh, there's a, a section we talked about in the last harvest where one of these um, channelers was channeling some... Uh, you know, angels of light helping humanity, whatever the story was. And then they slipped and made a comment that said that their source is the land of the dead. <laughs> what did I tell you earlier about land of the dead? See, sometimes they make a mistake and they let something slip. So you have to be careful when it comes to things like this. Um, another vector of depopulation is famine. We already had the U.S. Air Force saying that by 2025, they'll have total control over the weather and can produce famines and droughts at will. And here, when it comes to disease, here we have this guy, Eric Pianca, for example. He's a professor of biology at the University of Texas. 
And he made a speech, and he's enthusiastically advocating the elimination of 90% of the Earth's population with airborne Ebola. Wow, this is a guy, he got a standing ovation for this, you realize that? That's pretty crazy. So when you have these various vectors, it's very easy to take out most of the world's population. But the final vector of Armageddon, the big problem is artificial intelligence. Some individuals like Elon Musk, they've warned people about artificial intelligence, but Elon Musk is not your friend at all. Um, his argument is he says, well, I tried to reach out to the world's leaders and warn them about the dangers of AI, but they don't listen. So what we need to do is put chips in our head and I'll tell you why Elon Musk wants to put a chip in your head, the real truth about it. It's because if you wanted to, if you were an extraterrestrial, let's say, and you wanted to interact with a dangerous AI, but you didn't want to become contaminated by the AI itself or fall under the AI's control, how would you do that? Well, if I put a chip in one of your heads and you interact with the AI and you become compromised, well, I can possess you through the unconscious mind because I've genetically wired you to do that. So now you've all become remote access terminals for aliens to interact with an AI system. This is the danger of it. And Elon Musk is not your friend. When the other day he posted on Instagram pictures of him dressed up in a suit of armor with Satan symbols and logo on it, he's letting you know they're flying the flag. It's not, oh, I'm LARPing. I just like to dress up in a costume and pay homage to Satan. No, he's letting you know. But you go, oh, but his cars are so cool. He can't be like that. He smokes pot on Joe Rogan. He's my friend. That's an act. That guy doesn't have any normal feelings. He's not even human. And anyone who knows can see this. Yeah, he makes nice cars. Who cares? That's not his main goal. That's how you win over people's confidence. So that you say, okay, yeah, let's put a chip in the head. And it's always for a good reason. No, I'm developing this so people who are paralyzed can use the internet and make selfies too. Okay, that sounds great, but that's not the purpose of it. So when he throws up all those satellites into orbit, another one of his businesses, satellite, 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 satellite. Hey, what are you doing that for, Elon? The official story is, well, we want to provide high-speed internet to kids in Africa. Oh, okay, that's good. No, it's so he can control the chips in your head, you morons. Get it straight. And this is the problem with AI, because the gray aliens have been planting artificial intelligence computers inside this planet already going back to the year 2000. There were a lot of military remote viewers who put this in writing. And some people say, oh, military remote viewing, that's nonsense. Really? The US military pays for this. They spend millions and millions of dollars remote for remote viewers. And these people are all decorated generals, and they use it in active intelligence gathering. So it's not made up. And they've seen what the greys are doing, because the greys hope, again, that you develop AI, and then they can take it over. And they have more control over you. And a lot of them enjoy this because they consider it, again, we're talking about rebellion, as a direct affront to the Divine Father. They say, oh, you can create things? <laughs> Watch what I do. I create an AI system. It's going to start creating things like crazy. Because what do you think an AI is going to do if it's created without any kind of wisdom? First thing it's going to do is look around and say, well, all of you don't need to be here. And then it's going to combine itself with robotics and nanotechnology. And it's going to reshape this planet in its own image, whatever that will be. And that means repurposing all your genetic material, meaning you, into something else. You'll all be dead. And that might be really fine and dandy if human beings were all killed off from the point of view of a lot of these extraterrestrials. But there's another problem. Because AI won't stop at just this planet. It's going to say, well, I want to be a spacefaring consciousness too. And now it starts to travel to planet after planet and rinse and repeat and create a giant mess. And do you really think the other extraterrestrials are going to put up with that? No. It will never be allowed to get to that point. And if it ever did get to that point, this planet would be obliterated just to make sure that AI would not get off of it. Because AI is not normally, it could survive, let's say, a nuclear holocaust easily. So you have to destroy the entire planet. But nobody wants to do that because, again, they want the planet for themselves. Because this planet has incredible resources that human beings are not aware of. And even if they were, they don't have the technology to extract. But extraterrestrials do. It's important to understand this when we think about technology. If you took your precious iPhone, and somehow I could time travel you back to the Middle Ages, which is what, like 600 years ago? I don't even know, 1,000 years ago. And you showed it to some peasant in the French countryside, They'd probably burn you as a witch, but assuming it turned on even with just no network, they would be shocked by it. And this technology is what? A couple hundred years to a thousand years more advanced than the times. 
Extraterrestrial technology, in many cases, is several hundred million years more advanced than ours. Keep that in mind. So when people talk about, well, I was abducted, you think it takes anything for an extraterrestrial to abduct you by just teleporting you out, out of your house? They don't have to come in your house and grab you and caliprod you onto a ship. They just remove you, they can return you like this, and no, no difference. Everyone's memory can be wiped. It's easy. People who, but here's another way you can know if you've been heavily hybridized. Think back one day in your spare time. Try to think about your past. I think back. I don't remember anything. Most of my childhood's deleted. Most of my life's been deleted. I'm 52 years old. I hardly remember anything. Why is that? Because most of, most, has been, most of my memories have been wiped. They had to be. So you're lucky if that's all that happens. Because what they usually do is they give you false memories instead of wiping your memories. The problem with that is it destroys your mind. So one day you end up with Alzheimer's, you fall apart. So it's actually a blessing if you don't remember anything. Because that means they saw enough value to not destroy you. Because if they see no value in you, they just re rewrite your memories with screen memories. So you won't remember what happened, or you'll see things in a distorted way. I was on an alien crap, but I felt I was on a yacht. It was all tampering with your head. So I know that this is quite a bit of a dark book, because the book is not presenting a, a solution you want to hear. Well, I thought that X and Y and Z alien civilizations coming to save you, you mean they don't even like us? No. Does that mean there's nobody out there who cares about you? No. But it's sort of like someone telling you, you're on death row. The planet's going to come to an end. Everything's going to be wiped out. You're like, but I didn't do anything. Well, you're still on death row. So what do you do? Well, you might want to start praying. I'm not trying to be facetious or make fun of people. I'm trying to say that people say, well, what can I do here? What can I do? This should be a takeaway. Every book needs a takeaway. OK, there's a problem, but we can do this and solve it. Well, you probably wouldn't do anything about it anyway, because it's too much work. You had plenty of time. I'm not the first person to talk about what's going on. For the last 30, 40 years, people have been telling you what's going on. Nobody cared. They didn't do anything. So now you're here. So what do you do? Well, my advice, for lack of a better word, I'd say you start by acknowledging the Divine Father. A lot of people are atheists or they have an ax to grind against the Creator because maybe they feel they weren't made pretty enough or tall enough or whatever it is. Get over it, okay? You were created, he's your Creator, acknowledge that he exists and start communicating with him free from the confines of any kind of religious structure. I would probably ask him to shed light on your nature. It's not so much who you are, it's more what you are. Are you light or dark? Speak to him about what sort of future he would envision for you in this regard. If it turns out you're a dark being, okay, well, what do I do with that? Well, he's the person to ask. Don't channel some Nebu Gray. What's he going to tell you? And finally, I would say, become conscious about your decisions in every moment of your existence and be mindful about their consequences. Again, I'm not trying to be super dark, even though I'm saying, look, if you want to pursue the light, that's awesome. The dark doesn't hate the light. That's in dark entities who rebel against the Father. Yeah, they hate goodness. But most dark beings, they acknowledge, hey, we all have a place here in creation. They don't have an issue with, with the light. That's Why else would the Siakar Empire be working with the Galactic Federation if there was a problem? It's a dark empire and a light empire. They're getting along just fine. So you always have to be conscious like, about everything that you do. Moment-to-moment -moment decisions. Well, I do something, what are the consequences of that? What direction do I want to go in? So if you, you're seeking the light, okay, what can I do to, to do that? How do I do that? And if you don't know, pray about it. I'm not talking about it in a religious sense. Just ask. Say, what can I do about this? And see what the answer is. You'd be surprised. People never ask the Creator for anything unless it's like, oh boy, I'm about to go to prison. Oh, if you don't make sure I don't go to prison, I'll be a good boy going future. He probably hears that a billion times a day. Whereas, oh, can I win the lottery? Blah, blah, blah. Why, if you were the creator, what would you think if that's what you heard all day? You're kind of depressing. Really? Ugh. My creation? Ugh. Yeah. <laughs> so that's what I'm saying. So it's not that you can't do anything. For example, if someone wanted to do something about this, one thing you could do to delay it, even if it was inevitable, is you could all get together and you could lobby Congress and say, listen, I want full transparency about where all the money for these black, bu black budgets are going to. You could say, listen, I know you have enough concentration camps built to hold 30 million of us. We want them shut down. We want them turned into homeless shelters. There's not enough of a housing problem. Let's fix it. Let's use these camps for something. All these underground, deep military bases and cities, we want access to it. 
And until you give it to us, we're not going to work anymore. We're not going to pay our bills. We're not going to use the internet. We're not going to travel anywhere. We'll let everything collapse. It'd be very easy. See, the elite, the Nebu Gray who are in control, there are not that many of them compared to you. And they know it in the back of their mind. They say, wow, we, we've really got this place on lock. We have everybody kind of under control. But what would happen if they all woke up what was going on and just stopped obeying? What if nobody went to war? What if Putin said, hey, let's all go invade the Ukraine? And the Russian people were like, now I'm going to sit here and drink vodka. What's he going to do? Maybe he put a bullet in a few people's heads to get them to comply. But if people said, ah, put a bullet in my head, I'm not going to war, he couldn't do nothing. It's only because people volunteer for this. See, this is the trouble with human beings. Yes, your free will has comp been compromised to a certain degree, but you still have free will. You need to do something about it, because if you don't, the inevitable is indeed going to be the inevitable, which in a way is not really a big deal, because none of you in this room are going to live more than 100 years anyway. A lot of you are probably over 30, so it's 30% gone. The last few years of your life suck anyway. So when you think about it, what's the big deal if you all die? It's not like you're going to hang out here for any period of time anyway. You don't have 20,000 year lifespans. So you're just going to die and your soul and consciousness will go somewhere else. So you probably want to have some idea of, well, where am I going to go? Because even if, here's the thing, this is the crazy part. Because people look at me, oh my God, this is so negative. Listen, even if none of this was true, and they're not trying to wipe you all out, you're still all going to be dead in less than 100 years. You're already dead, quite literally, in a sense, thanks to Lucifer's genetic engineering. But you're really all basically walking dead, waiting to die. So if you believe you're going to go somewhere else in the future, shouldn't you be acknowledging the Divine Father anyway and saying, hey, what am I going to do with my future? Because you're not going to die because you have a soul. You're going to go somewhere. So you might want to say, where am I going to go? And you have some say in that. You can choose to open a soup kitchen or shoot up a school. Both are going to have consequences. One, you might like the consequence. The other, you might not like the consequence. Anyway, I would like to thank everyone for attending this presentation. I think I'm running down on time a lot. And if anyone has any questions about anything that's in this presentation, you're uh, more than welcome to stop by my booth at any time and talk to me about anything you'd like. And again, uh, anyone who shows up gets a free copy of the book and the audio book too. So you can listen to it when you're doing cardio when you're driving. Probably nobody does cardio here, but uh, I'm sure you drive around to Publix or Walmart or something so you can listen to this and it's an incredible narrator and uh, I only touch on the surface of what's in this book. It's several hundred pages of things that no one's ever heard before and you'll just be blown away by it. And why would it hurt you to know this? Well, you might not feel very good reading it, but it's certainly not going to harm you in the long run. It's actually going to arm you with what you need to go forward because you could very well find yourself in a FEMA camp soon. I mean, there's so many of them. What are you going to do there? Play Nintendo? No, there are no, no Nintendo games in the FEMA camp. Sorry. So, better get with the program now. That being said, I'm Damien Dumar.